the lecture of this hour is on Darwinian evolution. Is man only an improved ape? Well, Skip's been doing an excellent job in studying along this line in this particular subject. Of course, he does a good job with everything that he addresses. We're looking forward to the lesson. His real name is Dennis. He is part of that prestigious firm, Dennis, Daniel, Daniel, and Danny, and David. So we've got a bunch of Ds. But Dennis Skip Francis is a graduate of Park College with a double major in a Bachelor of Science degrees in Management and Computer Information Systems. He's retired from the U.S. Air Force, and he began preaching for the Mountain Home Idaho Church. He has served congregations in various states, including Idaho, Missouri, Virginia, and now Kansas. In fact, he is uh, uh, currently working with the Grant Street Congregation in Liberal, Kansas. He is married wonderful wife named Kay and has three children living with him, Sean, Brian, Mary. And, uh, you know, it, it's sort of bittersweet to introduce him. I've had the privilege the last six years or so of working with him in the Tidewater area. And he is more than just a fellow gospel preacher. He is a very precious and dear friend. His family is virtually like family in so many other ways. And uh, we appreciate him. Love him, love his uh, good wife and his uh, children. They're very dear friends with my daughter. And uh, Skip, just come free. I'll begin by thanking Daniel for that kind introduction. I also mention the wonderful eldership and Brother Brown that serves this congregation and their stand for the truth. I do notice that Brother Brown isn't here at the moment. I, I'm guessing it's because he didn't want to be here when the liberal preacher was up here preaching. <laughs> I wanted to address this topic. Oh, let me also mention that uh, I know that uh, Brother Cole mentioned I was going to preach on dinosaurs. Actually, I'm not, uh, but that is the topic in my chapter in the book that Daniel was pointing out earlier. So if you want to get that book, you can read that, uh, that lesson. Uh, I want to address this topic, Darwinian evolution is man only an improved ape, from two perspectives. The first perspective I want to address is a Bible perspective. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2-7. Any questions? Well, I guess we'll go on to talking about it from a science perspective. You know, it would be great if it was that easy to just present the Word of God as the truth, and that would settle the matter. You know, it's like the old, there used to be a bumper sticker out that said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You know, the only problem is that bumper sticker was wrong. God said it. That settles it, whether I believe it or not. I do want to begin my science part of this uh, discussion with a disclaimer. No animals were harmed in the writing of this manuscript. <laughs> <clears throat> and no apologetics press material was used. I hope to show that the church can both survive and teach Christian apologetics, whether apologetics press survives or not. I am a big fan, from the time I was quite small, of science fiction. As a matter of fact, I probably learned to read by reading the works of Robert Heinlein and Andrew Norton and Isaac Asimov, atheist though he was, among others. In 1948, when the genre of science fiction was still young, Robert Heinlein, who was known as the dean of science fiction, coined the phrase speculative fiction 
to describe a variety of such types of work and then came up with the following definition. Realistic speculation about possible future events based solidly on adequate knowledge of the real world, past and present, and on a thorough understanding of the nature and significance of the scientific method. Unfortunately, you can fill volumes with the speculations that have been made that simply did not come true. George Orwell famously imagined a world vastly different from ours in the book 1984, which was some 25 years ago. Arthur C. Clarke saw us going to Jupiter in 2001. Life on the moon, Mars, Venus, and numerous other planets in our solar system have all been imagined by various writers of speculative fiction in times past. It's kind of like Ronald Reagan said concerning political liberals. He said, it isn't that they're ignorant, it's that they know so much that isn't so. Well, the same can be said for evolutionists. This year, coincidentally, is the 200th birthday of Charles Darwin and the 150th anniversary of the publishing of The Origin of Species. Now, though Darwin did a fine job in collecting data for the book, the rest simply falls into the category of speculative fiction. Emphasis, of course, on the word fiction. In fact, this is not an uncommon problem when it comes to evolutionary-minded science. In the film, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, Richard Dawkins, the current best mind among the atheists, espouses his belief that life here on Earth was seeded by a race of aliens. Sounds a lot like science fiction to me. Resistance is futile and live long and prosper. To get life from rocks and dirt and to evolve man from amoeba requires far more than science can offer and conflicts directly with what the Bible teaches. The scriptures teach that man did not evolve from a lower creature, but that God formed man from the dust. I am going to borrow a quote from Terry Hightower from his manuscript. I've got to be careful here not to quote Terry too much, because it would take up most of my time. <laughs> but the comment that he made in his manuscript referring to the idea of this concept of man being evolved from some lower creature, was that scientists want to take us from goo to you through the zoo. And that's exactly what we're reading about, and exactly what they're teaching at the grade school, at the middle school, at the high school, and at the college level. Much of the speculation about early man has been centered on the differences between perceptions, and that's really what we're talking about. The perception of what modern man should look like and what early man is believed to have looked like. Even in modern times, man's appearance differs widely in various places on Earth. The differences between a Middle European and Alaskan Inuit and an Australian Aborigine are astounding. It's this very difference that shows why the so-called missing links are still missing. And they are missing. And that's why they call them missing links. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity. I'm a big guy for tools. You know, I'm like the Tim Taylor guy around my neighborhood. I like tools, and the more power they got, the better I like them. But they make a tool called a bolt cutter, and I remember the janitor in high school referring to the bolt cutter as the universal key. <laughs> but there's something that a bolt cutter does that I took particular notice of, and that's when you use it, it makes this very satisfying sound, this clank, 
as it cuts right through whatever it is that it's trying to cut through, whether it be a hasp on a lock or a link in a chain. Many of the missing links have been debunked over the years, but the evolution-minded scientist still clings to the notion that there is proof that man has a common ancestor with apes. They have pictures of them and statues of them in the museum. And you kind of wonder if maybe Eve was running around with her little Polaroid just taking pictures of all these, these critters because this is what we see at the museum. One of the classic hoaxes in search for the missing link and I call it a hoax for a reason. They're fakes, frauds, hoaxes, every single one of them in some form or another. Oh, maybe not entirely intentional, but they are nonetheless. One of the first ones was known as Piltdown Man. Charles Dawson discovered Piltdown Man when a worker at a gravel pit handed him a portion of a human skull in 1908. Now later on in 1912, he along with Arthur Smith Wood Woodward and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin began an expedition of this site, or excavation. It was then that they discovered the lower jaw of what came to be known as Piltdown Man. The skull, the, the, the skull itself was decidedly modern, very consistent with modern man. The jaw, on the other hand, was decidedly ape-like, yet the teeth were similar to human teeth. This discovery stood as proof of a missing link for 45 years. It was only then that the jaw and tooth were found to be that of an orangutan, and that the teeth themselves had been filed down to appear more human. When the Piltdown fossils were put on display at the British Museum, plaster casts were made to show to the public, but the public wasn't told they were looking at plaster casts. While folks thought they were looking at the actual fossils, they were only viewing representations of these fossils. Marvin Lubenow made this statement. He said they were looking at fakes of fakes. Did you hear that clink? At one time, it was taught that man actually evolved from the ape. Of course, you know, there's an obvious question that plagues this response. If man descended from the ape, why do we still have apes? Well, this prompted the evolutionists to change his story, and I might point out they changed their story a lot. They now only believe that man came from a common ancestor with the ape. And not that man descended directly from the ape. The common ancestor has been given a name, $50 jawbreaker kind of name, Pithecanthropus erectus. This is the second link in the chain of evolution of man we will seek to cut. Because now we're going to talk about Java man. Now Java man only barely escapes being considered an outright fraud. Though its discovery and subsequent conclusions are now being debunked, it was not, it had not been proven that fraud was intended. Of course, that often happens as well. Fueled heavily by the belief that early man could be found in Southern Asia or Africa, as taught by his good professor, Ernst Haeckel, Eugene Dubois traveled to Sumatra seeking to be the discoverer of the first man. As, a, as kind of a side note, we need to understand that this, is the, that this professor was the same Ernst Haeckel who was found guilty of fraud when he faked scientific evidence in order to prove the common origins of man and other life forms through what's called the recapitulation theory. Dubois didn't find what he was looking for in Sumatra, but heard of a skull having been found in Java, so he traveled there to investigate it. He purchased that skull. And he found another, but he was disappointed to discover that they were too much like the skulls of Homo sapiens. That would be you and me. 
It was only later that he made his finds along the Solo River that came to be known as Java Man. These consisted of a skull cap, three teeth, part of a jaw, and a human femur. Now these all had to be dug from the ground over a significant period of time and were geographically separated from one another by a distance of over 50 feet. Now this led a lot of people to wonder if the bones were even from the same source. Though Java man had originally been classified in the general category of Homo erectus, even Dubois was ultimately forced to admit that though the femur probably was human, and not at all unlike modern man in any, in any sense of the word, the skull cap was probably something that belonged to a giant gibbon, which is another ape. Malcolm Bowden said, it is possible that had these been carried out with the scientific objectivity of the Solenka expedition, Java man would not be gracing our museums and textbooks in this day and age. Dubois also kept secret his similar find at Wajak of skulls that were decidedly modern. It took him 30 years to bring forward this part of his find, making one wonder why it took so long, unless it was an effort to keep them from discrediting his Java man. Did you hear that clank? In the 1920s and 30s, about 25 miles from the city of Peking in China, were found a number of fossils consisting largely of about 30 skulls, 11 mandibles, and about 147 teeth. Now, I want you to take notice of something. Every time these guys say they found early man, some hominid, back in history, it's like they brought in one of them great big um, machines they used to shred the, the bark off trees <laughs> and just scattered stuff everywhere. Because they never seemed to be able to find one of them intact. They find all these bits and pieces. The earliest find was a single tooth. And immediately they declared it belonged to an ancient hominid thus beginning the spin which became known as Peking man. Much of the speculation that was prompted that this was early man was the, because of the cranial capacity of the skulls, in other words, the size of the brain as they would estimate in this thing. The fact is that cranial capacity varies widely, even in modern man, ranging from an average size as small as 800 cc's to as large as 1,800 cc's. In fact, there are recorded sizes of as small as 515 cc's among the Bantu tribes of sub-Saharan Africa, a brain capacity only roughly compatible with that of a gorilla. Now, this differs greatly from men like Oliver Cromwell. I know that Ken's familiar with Oliver Cromwell. We, uh, we did a little work in, uh, in his house, <laughs> whose great brain capacity was recorded as 200 or 2,200 cc's. But you know what? Brain size has little to do with intelligence. There were many of Cromwell's contemporaries who were of equal intelligence yet had smaller craniums than he did. Of two men of modern times that had the largest recorded cranial capacity, one was a functioning idiot and the other was a United States Senator. <laughs> now I realize that some of you are thinking they must have been the same person. No, I'm not talking about Al Franken. The cranial capacity of the Peking man skulls was estimated at about 900 cc's. The problem, however, with these measurements is that these skulls weren't found intact. In fact, few of these fossils are ever found in a fully formed state. Thus, it's necessary to attempt to reconstruct the skulls, most often with some of the pieces missing. I don't know how many of you have ever attempted to put together a jigsaw puzzle when a substantial amount of the pieces were missing. 
I, I had a roommate when I was in the service that used to do these uh, expert level crossword puzzles, or not crossword, but jigsaw puzzles. And I've seen him put together things that were kind of incredible to me. Uh, you know, me, I have to get an idea what the picture looks like. He was one of these guys that could tell from the shape of the pieces. One time he did a black cat on a black background, and I couldn't even tell for sure it was a cat when he was done. But it's, it's greatly difficult to do this when all, the, when all the pieces aren't there. This has been the consistent problem with all such fossil finds. The fossils are not complete and require extensive speculation as to how to put the pieces back together. The vast majority of so-called missing link fossils are incomplete. And not just incomplete, but highly incomplete. Of course, that contrasts with the literally hundreds of complete Homo sapiens remains that are frequently discovered in the same fossil strata as the missing links, yet are subsequently ignored by those who are looking for a missing link. In the realm of measuring the brain capacity, there are some obvious mathematical problems. So I don't want to overburden anyone who may not be real good in math, but volume increases geometrically with estimated size. If one were to double the sides of a box with equal dimensions, the volume within, the, within increases by a factor of eight. In other words, if you take a box that's two by two by two, it has a volume of eight cubic inches. If you take a box at four by four by four, it has a volume of 64 cubic inches. I had to learn this quite a bit recently when I made the move from Suffolk, Virginia to Liberal, Kansas. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to understand that a slight difference in the assumed circumference of the skull can make a large difference in how the brain capacity is estimated. What's also interesting about the Peking man is that all the fossil evidence has disappeared, with the exception of two teeth. There's no one alive today that knows what happened to the Peking man fossils. Many believe today that the Peking man remains were, in reality, giant apes that were hunted for food. Dwayne Gish points out, at the very least, a combination of prejudice, preconceived ideas, and a zeal for fame have been responsible for elevating an ape-like creature to the status of an ape-like man. Did anyone hear that clink? I remember a time when I was young, and that was a long time ago, we were still watching black and white TV. When I was homesick from school, I was allowed to watch television, and a particular movie caught my attention. It was called The Neanderthal Man. I thought, oh, this is going to be a film about, uh, about the distant past. Well, it wasn't. It was about a modern scientist who was given a fossilized coelacamp, which used to be thought to be extinct, and they found out it's not. It's alive and thriving. And that fluid from this melting fish got into his body, and he began to devolve into this Neanderthal man in much the same way that Larry Talbot, fictional character, used to morph into the wolf man when Lon Chaney Jr. played him. Recent studies of Neanderthal fossils is done by Jack, Dr. Jack Quazzo who has a specialty in orthodontics, showed that much of what we have been shown regarding Neanderthals has been an error. In fact, some of it goes beyond mere prejudice and into the realm of intent to defraud. Dr. Quazzo was granted access to Neanderthal remains by the Musée de l'Homme in Paris and was allowed to use a portable x-ray machine on the remains. During his initial examination of the skull of a Neanderthal child known as Pestalaz, comparing his work with the official version, he found that the French scientists had malocluded the lower jaw in the representations and photographs that had been put forward to the scientific community. 
In other words, they had intentionally or not misaligned the jaw, which ostensibly would give the child a more ape-like appearance. In further examination, Quazzo also discovered a similar malocclusion of the La, La Chapelle au Saint skulls and jaws. After placing these skulls and jaws into their proper perspective, Dr. Quazzo took x-ray pictures of the remains, working over a period of three days. He kept a set of the pictures for his own research and gave a duplicate set of the pictures to the museum. Well, this is where, in the words of Sherlock Holmes, the game is afoot. For the next several days, the account of the adventures of Dr. Quazzo and his family reads like a spy thriller. He was being followed. Attempts were made to break into his hotel room as he slept with his family. Suspicious phone calls were received. Familiar automobiles were seen repeatedly. And faces in the crowd became familiar in events that defied coincidence. The accounts of these events are in Dr. Quazzo's book, Buried Alive. You know, one should not be surprised by the attempts being made by the evolution-minded scientific community to suppress alternative information. The accounts of many scientists who expressed an alternative view, and especially the creationist view, have all experienced very similar things. They often find themselves ostracized, repressed, and even victimized for their views. This was shown very well in the film Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, starring Ben Stein. Dr. Quazzo's continued studies of various of the Neanderthal remains, as well as visits to locations where such remains were discovered, have given rise to some new conclusions with regard to the so-called Neanderthal man. Already we can see that the Neanderthal was not ape-like in any respect. In fact, it's only subtle differences between the various races of modern man that account for the differences in the appearance of Neanderthal and people alive today. In fact, according to two authorities, if Neanderthal man could be reincarnated and placed in a New York subway, provided that he were shaved, bathed, and dressed in modern clothing, it's doubtful whether he would attract any more attention than some of its other denizens. Dr. Quazzo comes to some other conclusions based on his further study of the Neanderthal that are far more consistent with what we know of God's word. In Genesis 5 and verse 5 we read, So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. What do we learn from this passage? We learn that man obviously had a different lifespan in the antediluvian age than he has today. We also find out that man matured at a different rate than he does today. In verse 3 it says, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. It would be highly unusual for a man to father a son at the age of 130 today. This is also demonstrated in the time following the flood, though the age of man is foreshortened by time by then. At a time when Abram was 75 years old and his wife Sarai was 66, it's recorded that she was still a beautiful and desirable woman. Now, I'm not, I'm not up here to offend anybody, ladies. <laughs> but that's highly unusual in this day and age, in the, in the situation that he was in. In Genesis 12, verse 11 and 12, it says, And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore it will happen <coughs> when the Egyptians see you that they will say this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Again, we see that man matured at different rates in the past and today. This is the same conclusion that Jack Quazzo came to in his Neanderthal studies. By measuring the length of the head and comparing the differing shapes of the Neanderthal skulls, along with an analysis of growth rates, every anomaly that exists between Neanderthal and modern man can be explained by age and maturation differences. 
Quazzo concluded that Neanderthals were really old. Isn't that what the Bible says? The Wolfman style depiction that I saw during my sick day is the one that stuck with so many as they see the popular depictions of Neanderthal and every other version of a so-called missing link portrayed in the museums. Still, as has been shown, is it truly an accurate picture of what we would have seen had we lived when they lived? Would we have seen an ape man, or would we have seen someone that might have reminded us of an Alaskan Inuit? Would we have seen something stooped and simian, or would we have seen something more closely resembling the Mongols? Is it any surprise that the man formerly known as Andre the Giant of wrestling fame came from Grenoble, France, about 300 miles from the famous Neanderthal finds in Le Moustier, France. Did anybody hear that clink? There's another set of finds we're going to talk about now, and that's Cro-Magnon Man, the, the fossils that were so named because of a cave that they were found in. It's of interest that these have been dated in such a way as to make them contemporary with the Neanderthal, and even in the same area. Though we've often heard of the Cro-Magnon as being a caveman, he's no longer in consideration as such due to the fact that he is really quite modern. In fact, we find that his cranial capacity is, in large part, slightly bigger than Homo sapiens. He's somewhat taller as well and was widely believed to be chiefly Caucasian. Most believe that Cro-Magnon and the Neanderthal not only lived at the same time, but had contact with one another, some even believing that Cro-Magnon was responsible for the demise of the Neanderthal, though this falls into the category of speculation again. What is known, however, is that similar cultures today have no problem coexisting with one another. Phil Saint points out they lived side by side just as white Australians live in the 20th century beside the aboriginal Bushmen who are Neanderthaloid type people. The Cro-Magnon is only under consideration because he's still classified as a caveman due, the, the, due to the discovery of cave paintings, although it's now known that they didn't live in them. In fact, they lived in huts constructed of rocks, clay, bones, branches, and animal hide. They also used several rudimentary tools. The Cro-Magnon is now classified as an early modern man, thus are not even a true link in the chain, so I won't even bother cutting that one. But one of the most contemporary finds, and the one that we often hear the most about, Considered to be the earliest hominid is the one that they call Lucy. Now this name was given because of the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, that was being played loudly and often in the camp of paleontologists at the dig site. It consists of a 40% complete skeleton, which was originally thought to have been in the form of a chimpanzee. I guess what's interesting about that find is that Donald jo Johansson, Lucy's discoverer, and now the founder of the Institute of Human Origins of Arizona State University, doesn't place Lucy in the ancestry of man, but others still do. Before I go on any further with this lesson, I want to ask a question. Do they have jackalopes in Texas? A lot of you laugh, so I'm guessing you know what I'm talking about. This is that fictitious creature where they take the rabbit and stick the horns on it and just kind of glue them on and created this thing they call a jackalope. Well, we're going we're gonna to see a little bit about jackalopes here in a minute. Lucy is in the, in the scientific category of Australopithecus afarensis, most probably a collection of ape bones and not even of one creature. In a similar situation to that of Java Man, much of Lucy was found over a wide-ranging area at different levels of strata. The various bones were simply pieced together to come up with a composite that's often put on display. Pointed out on the website of Henry Johnson, he identified various differences that show up 
when pictorial representations of Lucy are given to the public. In other words, each picture is a little different. The various pictures have obvious, even to the most casual observer, differences in them. Bones are placed in different locations, turned up, turned down, adjusted, depending on the audience that they're trying to impress. Johnson refers to Lucy as a jackalopian composite, and I believe that's correct. It seems evident from the pictures that the scientists really don't know how Lucy should be constructed due to the fact that she's not remotely human in any sense. Why is it that so many attempt to see what they want to see instead of what is really there? Bowden put it this way, he said, this tendency to see hominid characteristics in almost any ape bone found appears to be endemic amongst fossil hunters. With this in mind, an unintended interpretation could be put upon a reply to the question of why no stone tools have been found. The answer was, we haven't looked for tools yet, and we tend to find only what we look for. Such has been the problem with most evolutionary science. They tend to find only what they look for. They profoundly want Lucy to be a true hominid, thus that is what they find. The evidence, however, is far different. Anatomist Charles Oxnard made the following observation. It's now recognized widely that the Australopithecines are not structurally closely similar to humans that they must have been living at least in part in arboreal environments, that's in the trees, and that many of the later specimens were contemporaneous or almost so with the early members of the genus Homo, that's you and I. Like her namesake, Lucy belongs in the fictional realm of tangerine trees and marmalade skies. I'm going to depart just for a minute to talk a little bit about technology because we can't pass up the study of the missing links without an understanding of the problem of technology. One of the ways in which our evolutionary scientists attempt to place our ancestors, those missing links, into definable niches is to classify them by virtue of their ability to make and use tools. Unfortunately, even in that, they ignore the lessons of history. Just as once was postulated by Francis Bacon, history is most often built on the back of other history. Would you reasonably expect to travel to Gettysburg and go on an archaeological dig of the battlefield and find they used Uzis and hand grenades? How about digging up the Colosseum in Rome? Would you expect to find that they'd use plasma screen monitors to do close-ups for the crowd? To go back to early man and expect them to be using the same kind of tools we use today is just as ridiculous. When a paleontologist finds rudimentary tools, he often speculates that the user of that tool either lacked the intelligence to make a better one or didn't have the motor skills to use something more sophisticated. In fact, the real problem is that technology builds on previous technology. Not long ago on the History Channel, I was watching a program that referred to the six degrees of separation, and of course they were talking a little bit about Francis Bacon and how with six connections throughout history, they could show how a woolly mammoth related to the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> now during the program, here was the sequence. Early man needed to be able to kill large beasts like the woolly mammoth in order to eat, so they developed the harpoon. The harpoon was used subsequently in the whaling industry. Whales were killed for their oil, which was used as a source for light. Edison created the light bulb as a new source for light, but had to get around a problem known as the Edison effect, which was eliminated by the creation of a vacuum within the light bulb. In order to, to create the vacuum, man had to create a vacuum chamber, thus requiring a vacuum suit. You see where I'm going with this? Man used this same vacuum suit in space in fixing the Hubble Space Telescope. Technology builds on technology. 
The fact is that early man would have been prone to using what's at hand before he would be manufacturing something else. His tools would have likely been made of stone, wood, bone, and the like. In fact, he would only have formed a special tool as the need arose and would likely have not thought to keep it as materials would be near at hand to make another. As is even true today, it's only when something new is needed that invention fills the gap. I remember an axiom from years of working in the maintenance field. We used to say, if it works, don't fix it. This statement was made because some people are prone to tinker with something that already does what it was made to do. If something is working, don't play with it. The same is true with technology. New inventions only tend to come about when there is a need for them and when the old tool is no longer capable of getting the job done. And even in our modern world, we have examples of very primitive tools and weapons that are still the best at what they do and are still being used as a result. The Australian Aborigine still uses the boomerang for hunting. Why? Because it works. It requires no additional materials, it makes no noise, and guess what? It comes back when it misses. The same thing can be said for blowguns that are still used among South American tribes. They work, so why invent something else? We also have many such tools that have been around since Adolf was a corporal, but we still use them because they work for what they're designed for. There's been a great effort to identify a creature as an ape man or hominid. The simple fact is that there is no such creature. There are no missing links, no pre-man. All the evidence we have before us can be fully explained by going back to the Bible. In the sacred book of God, we see similar differences among men. Goliath of Gath was one example of a man who was different than us, being 10 feet tall. Then we notice the considerably more diminutive Zacchaeus. Which one of these was a hominid? Goliath was probably very like the Curl Magnon, while Zacchaeus was similar to our Lucy, yet neither was anything but man. Is man an improved age? Darwinian evolution is wrong. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Brother Daniel, I think we'll keep him in the firm. Talking about Daniel Cole there. We got a bunch of Deb. We have Dennis's and we have Dubs and we have Daryl's and we have Daniels. And... Oh yes, and uh, Ken Chumley, who's the treasurer of the firm. That's right. Great presentation, outstanding material, and we appreciate the study. He mentioned how hard Deshardine. Uh, Deschardins is one of the uh, uh, patron saints, so to speak, of the postmodernists right now. Uh, his book, The Phenom Phenomenon of Man, is uh, uh, promoted big time among them. They just love him to death, despite the fact he is one of the leading suspects behind the Piltdown Man fraud. It just shows postmodernists don't care what the truth is. Uh, it's whatever furthers their purpose. That's, it's the intent that's more important. We appreciate that tremendous study. Let's stand adjourned until the next service.